we, we look back, uh, we see back 380,000 years to the Big Bang. And if the inflationary hypothesis is right, we can go back further to infer what happened a very tiny fraction of a second before the universe began, uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, roughly. And then we have the dawn of time, at which point scientific observation currently has reached the hall. Some might say it forever will reach the hall. We also learned that the content of the universe is very different than what we thought, and most of what we see in this room, the elements the, that we learned in the periodic table in high school, are really only appear to be about 4% of the known universe. The other 20, another 23% is dark matter, and all the rest of it appears to be something called dark energy, whose only property we know of is that it's anti-gravitational. It is causing the universe to accelerate, to speed up in its expansion uh, instead of slow down. These findings, I would like to emphasize, are very new. The ones in the upper right corner were found within the last eight years. And once the microwave background explorer just 11 years ago. This is enormously new information, even by scientific standards. Next, please. The purpose of showing this slide is just to emphasize that we have now a lot of precise information about the cosmology. We know the ratios of the different energy content. We know the uh, abundances of the light elements. And the function of showing this slide, we know the age of the universe, we know uh, quite a number of other things, I, I'm not going to go into everything that's on here. The point of showing you this slide is to point out to you that these insights science has given us from cosmology are quantifiable and precise. And this precision is also very recent. I remember when I was a graduate student, um, uh, in the 1980s, people despaired that we would ever gain such precise cosmological information. Cosmology in the early 21st century has moved uh, into the era of precision science and is therefore able to rule out a lot of models that before just could not be ruled out. So I want to emphasize to you there is a lot of quantitative data backing up picture I am describing. It is not just scientific speculation. Next to this. So, what about religion? Why are theists happy with modern cosmology? Well, not all of them, but lots of them are, and I think the reasons are basically as follows. One is, the universe has a beginning. This is often underplayed by people, especially curiously enough to be some Christian theologians. I think this is a remarkable fact. It could have been otherwise. We know how old we are as a cosmos, 13.7 billion years plus or minus 2 for the point 0.2 in years. That's a remarkable result. That's better than I'm able to do myself in a chemistry experiment in the lab. That's why I became a theorist. The universe, sorry, the universe has a law-like, intelligible structure. It's not a mindless entity in the sense that it cannot be comprehended. The laws of physics seem to work everywhere and every when that we are able to probe, not perhaps with absolute perfection, some would point out scientific limitations, but they work pretty darn well. The universe exhibits contingent behavior. As we have studied it, we realize that its conditions and the state that it is in could have been different from the way it is now. What we have now is contingent on what happened earlier. And finally, and this is what I want to spend the rest of the talk on, the universe exhibits selection effects. Next, please. The selection effects are as follows. All complex structures in the universe, particularly light, obey the laws of physics that depend on numbers to measure in experiments. Numbers like Newton's constant, the speed of light, Planck's constant, charge on the electron, the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron, the neutron, and there are others. And I put the actual values that you can get from, for example, the handbook of chemistry and physics, just to let you know the level of precision with which we have it. Now, when the average person looks at this, they think, well, this is sort of boring stuff. What's the 
big deal. Who cares what the numbers are except for a few engineers and scientists that maybe don't get out there much? Well, we've discovered something very interesting in the last three decades. Next. Consider an atom. Next. Keep pushing the button. An atom has electrons, protons, and neutrons symbolized by the uh, colored dots that I have. And what we've discovered is, suppose we ask the question, what if the neutron were 0.2% lighter than what we measure it to be? Suppose we said, okay, I'm God, I'm going to make a universe, but I've decided the neutrons in this universe are 0.2% lighter. Why not? What, would, what harm would this do? Well, it would kill us. All protons would decay in the early universe because it would upset the uh, nucleosynthesis processes that happen there. We wouldn't have any protons, we would have no atoms, no molecules, and none of us would be here to discuss the issue. Similarly, what if it were a little heavy, 0.2%? Well, if that were true, hydrogen would not be able to form. In the early universe, as the universe was expanding, we would get so much helium, hydrogen would not be energetically favored. We would have no water, no DNA, again, no life. At least no life that we have any evidence could exist. This is a rather remarkable fact that was not the least bit obvious of something that was only discovered three decades ago. Next. There are many other such selection events. The vacuum energy of the universe, the expansion rate of the universe, the number of dimensions we live in. Why do we live in three dimensions? Why don't we live on flat land? Or why don't we live in seven or 55 dimensions? The ratio of the number of particles to the number of antiparticles in the universe, the ratio of the mass of the neutron to the mass of the proton, and on it goes. Push the uh, button, please. If these things are too big or too fast, we run into disaster, and life as we know it cannot exist. Similarly, if these things are too small or too slow, we run into disaster again. We can't form galaxies. We can't bind atoms together. We can't form stable nuclei, etc. We only get helium. We only get hydrogen. The point of this is that many of the things we observe in physics have special particular values such that if they were not the values they had, no life as we know it would exist. Now this is a, a, an empirical fact, and that is what I mean by a selection effect. This is not, in my opinion, an obvious effect. It could have been true that if we quadrupled the mass of the neutron, cut Newton's constant in half, and did a number of other things, life as we know it could go on. That would be a non-selection effect. That would mean life doesn't care about that. But what we have learned recently is that our existence cares a great deal about this. So it seems that we live in a universe fine-tuned for life. So if somebody hit a bullseye in picking out a universe that we could live in, there are two ways of interpreting this. One is that there is an intelligent agent that made a choice from a set of alternatives. We call this God, or at least I would. The other possibility is that there are many similar attempts, and sooner or later you get lucky. This is called the many universe philosophies, or the multi universe hypothesis. So if you don't want God, one way of explaining this is that our observable universe is just one tiny fraction of bazillions of universes. I don't know how you translate bazillion in Italian, but it means lots. And, um, mucho. Uh, and, and so, if you have many possible universes, and every time you get one, you change things a little bit, well, sooner or later, you'll just get lucky. Much in the same way that if you dealt a deck of cards in poker, if you keep playing the game long enough, eventually you're going to get dealt with royal flesh. The laws of statistics demand this. So, this seems to be the choice. Lee Smolin proposed next, please, a third alternative called cosmological Darwinism. And the idea is that the complex, life-permitting selection effects of our universe arise from a process of evolutionary selection um, that maximizes the production of black holes. And Lee points out that if you have a view of the universe, that can only be 
read from the outside, it suggests there is a God, because who else could be looking at it? We don't have any other candidates. Lee would like to avoid this. He says, my science always lead back to the religion of its inventors and first practitioners. Or is it possible to imagine a science that um, could be expanded to a complete and objective description of the universe, while at the same time denying the possibility the description could be read by being outside? So the motivations for this model, I think, have a lot to do with theism, or perhaps one should say a theism. So how does this idea work? Well, the idea is the following. Gravitational, yeah, pause please. Gravitational collapse to a black hole can give rise to a new universe. That's the hypothesis. When a star burns out, if the star is initially dense enough, if it's initially massive enough, we have lots of evidence, theoretically, we can calculate it, empirically, while not proven, we now have very strong, suggestive evidence that black holes will result. We have very good evidence that there are a million solar mass black holes in the cores of galaxies, and a few solar mass black holes orbiting around. So the hypothesis here is that inside the black hole, as everything collapses, some physical process causes it to balance and create a new universe. Okay, so quantum birth of a new universe will give it physical constants that differ a little bit from the universe it came from. So the black hole gives rise to a new universe, or a baby universe, a Bambino universe, and the Bambino has slightly different characteristics from its mom. The, new, the mass of the neutron might be different. The mass of the electron might be different. Um, next, please. So suppose the electron mass in our universe it has a value on the left there. And the, uh, excuse me, I'm, go back, please. Um, and the one on the right differs slightly. Well, on the left, black holes might be more likely. On the right, black holes might be less likely. So in that baby universe, as it grows up, it will make less black holes. It will have fewer children. So the most fertile universe, if you believe this hypothesis, will be the one that has physical constants that maximize black hole production. So out of all possible universes, the prediction of this model is that a typical universe, maybe ours, will be one in which black hole production is maximized. It's as best as it could possibly be. So the constants of nature, the model predicts that the constants of nature, the speed of light, the mass of the electron, Newton's constant, etc., are maximized for black hole production. Next week. So the replication is as follows. Black holes must be able to produce baby universes in other words, evolving space-time containing energy and matter that are governed by the laws of physics. The variation, push the button, please. The variation is that the laws of physics or constants of nature must change slightly as each new universe is born. Next. And the selection is that observers are more likely to find themselves in a universe for which black hole production is maximized. So, here's how it works. We have some, on what I've got in this chart is on one axis I have the mass of the neutron, on the other axis I have the mass of the proton, and on the vertical axis is the probability to produce black holes, or perhaps not the probability, but the rate at which black holes will be produced. So you can see, if you look at that little star there, the universe starts out at random somewhere here, and it it hardly has any other black holes. Push again, please. So if but the neutron and proton mass change a little bit and it's baby, but that baby, it just has one baby. It's not very good at having babies. Do it again, please. So there it goes. That one also only has one baby. Again, please. Well, now it's getting closer to a P. So when you push the button again, now the neutron and proton mass are such that this universe, with those protons and neutron masses, give rise to more black holes, so we get more babies. So the peaks are where you have lots and lots and lots of babies. 
when I was young, I I was a child, when I was young, I lived in between two Italian families. One had 13 children, the other had none. I was one. So I was like a child of the flat part, living in between those two mountain peaks where they had lots of children. I thought maybe it was something. And so we pushed the button again. We'll get lots and lots of families. We'll get lots of black holes on these peaks, or rather, lots of universes, because those universes have values of the neutron and proton mass that maximize black hole production. And the argument is, we are here because we evolved to a state where it's more likely that our kind of universe will exist, because we're more like families that have lots of big universes than the families that have little in the whole context of all possible universes. Next, please. So the prediction is that our universe is at a local maximum of the production rate of black holes. So if we change the values of the electron mass, the neutron mass, the speed of light, black hole production would drop. Now, we can only change those at this point in history in a thought experiment. But if we gained enough astrophysical information about black holes, we could at least try the thought experiment. So the model is weakly <laughs> falsifiable. So, for example, small increases in the weak interaction coupling give you either only, give you only hydrogen, and small decreases give you only helium in your universe. If you had only hydrogen, you would have no mechanism for making supernova. This would give a lower black hole, lower star production rate, therefore fewer black holes. If you had only helium, stars would burn too quickly. The history of the galaxy would be changed. You couldn't draw firm conclusions. But Lee points this out as a way of saying yes, the hypothesis could in principle be checked. However, it has its critics for its discontents. George Allison Tony Rothman said that the universe with lots of black holes is not necessarily the same as a universe with lots of stars, i.e. a life permitting universe. So if we have lots of black holes, that doesn't necessarily mean we have a universe that is favorable to life. And to give an example of this um, that I, I won't go into here, universes with many primordial black holes, that means many black holes created at the beginning of the Big Bang, should be selected. But the inflationary paradigm of the universe doesn't like this. So there's a bit of a problem. There's no environment for the selection. What's the environment in the multiverse? What's causing the selection pressure? Um, Bill Dempsey has pointed out that this is explanatory power without independent evidence because we can't look inside a black hole to check. Or at least if you go in, you might learn it. You can never tell anybody else. Finally, George Ellison pointed out this doesn't really solve the metaphysics. There, the constants of nature apparently evolve, but only by invoking a constant super mechanism. That landscape of peace now becomes the ultimate reality. Where does that come from? Would be the question. So I'm almost done here. I can see the speakers checking the watch. So one more, please. So for Christian theism, there have been a number of ideas that have been proposed to say that Christian theism is compatible with biological evolution. My challenge there is how far can we go? Albert Mantello suggested that um, we have a fully gifted universe. Would he suggest we have a fully gifted multiverse? John Houchin suggests that there's a sacred omega beckoning all life forms to the future. Is this omega beckoning all multiverses to the future? or the multiverse to the future, is God's activity hidden in cosmological natural selection. George Murphy has suggested God's activity is hidden in biological selection. Could we maybe say extrapolation here? Are there intelligent designers designing all these multiverses? Or, and this is my proposal, are there limits of tolerance regarding Darwinism? Can we really push the idea this off. And that is my challenge to both the scientists and to the theists, or theologians here, I should say. So one slide, please. That's the last one. Cosmological Darwinism is a scientific paradigm 
that eliminates a telic interpretation of the universe and replaces it with an ecbatic one. But how much teleology can we do without it? That's it.
So on this axis, you have the tension in the DNA. This is like the knot, uh, the amount of stress if you stretch this molecule apart. <coughs> on this axis, you have the net rate at which this enzyme is replicating DNA. And you can see, as you vary this knot, the amount of stress on the DNA, you tune the velocity, this is the speed at which replication occurs, from 100 base pairs per second, roughly, to around Thank you. 
conditions in the environment be somehow exploited to get uh, systems that are uh, organized in a way. So for example, this demon here is sitting. Traditionally, you'd expect hot, you have know, a bunch of hot molecules here that over time, uh, and cold molecules here over time, they will equilibrate with each other. Unless you have some kind of uh, intelligent being here that can sort out the molecules and sort of go against entropy and separate the hot from the cold. And where this comes into play, I'll show you in the, in the concept of understanding these molecular motors that are leading information from the DNA interacting to their body, uh, is, is the following. Let me just describe the system of a ratchet that uh, Richard Feynman has found in the mind quite some depth. And that is, imagine a, a Brownian, this is a ratchet, and you have uh, random thermal fluctuations in the environment here that are kicking around this windmill. And you would imagine, this is uh, sort of, at first glance, you may naively imagine that because of this softening potential, as you kick around the windmill here, you get a sort of directed, directed mechanical motion of this field, even though you have random thermal fluctuations. However, as I pointed out, it's not quite true, because uh, this uh, fall would also be fluctuating, and therefore, even though you'd be getting some build-up of work in the basis of so this function. Unless these two systems are out of equilibrium and you have this environment at a different temperature than this, and then you can selectively drive the system using thermal fluctuations, but of course without violating the second law of thermodynamics. And where this is interesting is we can begin to use these kind of concepts to understand how these uh, motor enzymes might behave like the Brownian reaction, exploiting principles. Uh, for example, this random this uh, motion of a motor on this uh, lattice corresponds to the diffusion of a particle on an energy landscape. And if this energy landscape fluctuates in a way that we can um, predict, we can begin to understand. So the idea of a ratchet is what I explained before. The idea is that if we begin to think of a, not just of the lattice of this ratchet framework, but provides a conceptual insight into how uh, the environment can once again couple into providing uh, direct motion of this motor along the DNA. And one of the things that's interesting, uh, to comment on the previous talk as well, is that this enzyme, as it reads DNA, generates mistakes. And these mistakes are the source of evolution in biology. These are the mutations. And one of the questions is, uh, that we're looking at is how we can manipulate that uh, generation of mutations or those mistakes by modulating the environment. And what this really comes down to is, is, is a very interesting question. Is, as uh, the previous speaker pointed out, um, Darwinian evolution thinks of um, mutations as random things that occur in the environment. It's a selection, provides a selection that selects in a way which information survives and which doesn't. Now, as we see here, if the environment can modulate or control the error rates or the amount of uh, mutations that occur, we now see a different level at which the environment can couple into the actual uh, development of of uh, this evolution of, the, of this information. And in a way, uh, this reminds us of Lamarck, who actually proposed, at least this is Lamarck at the molecular level, whereby the environment couples into information, or, or the evolution of the information at the molecular level. So is that clear? Does that concept make sense? So we have this slide also. And uh, it's interesting, I was thinking out on the other side, what paradigms did we take by studying living systems and understanding processes like self-replication? What in, in developing conceptual frameworks to understand that? What implications does that have in understanding things like uh, the universe and uh, organization of matter on larger scales? And I want to leave you with a thought. About a hundred years ago, Albert Einstein gave us a framework, a conceptual framework, to understand energy and matter on an equivalent footing. And that framework has pretty much uh, enabled a number of uh, 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 insights and discoveries during the past century. Uh, 
fugge dall'osservazione e dall'esperienza anche in termini empirici provenga dal livello di coscienza, ovvero dal punto di vista che l'osservatore assume. Per cui vedere la vita come una espansione della materia o un ulteriore sviluppo della materia dipende dal punto di vista e quindi dipende dal livello di coscienza. O vedere come la materia si sviluppi pian piano da una eh, energia non fisica extra fisica o antifisica che produce poi la materia fisica. Quello che voglio dire io oggi, il mio contributo utile eh, molto rapido perché il tempo a disposizione come avete visto è veramente poco, vorrei parlare della eh, creazione dell'universo ma da, la sua origine psichica, come sia l'universo psichico che origina l'universo fisico. Queste deduzioni o queste osservazioni eh, rappresentano l'esperienza di commento recenti della mia vita, ma i miei punti di riferimento, per i punti di riferimento teorici di quel che dico, provengono da scienze antiche, da testi antichi, in particolar modo la vita, il Bhagavan, la filosofia Sankhya e altri testi. Ora, il punto importante che vorrei porre di fronte alla vostra attenzione è l'origine psichica dell'universo fisico. Ovviamente fisico e psichico sono due paradigmi, sono due mondi che appaiono soltanto separati, sempre dal punto di vista della coscienza di chi li osserva. Ma c'è un punto di vista o un livello coscienziale in cui l'aspetto fisico e l'aspetto fisico si congiungono e si integrano in una visione armonica della vita, producendo un insieme che non può essere più considerato scisso, distaccato, separato da quello stesso punto di vista. Ora, l'aspetto più importante è che la filosofia santia, questa antichi ricci, gli antichi saggi, i leggenti, dei vecchi che hanno tramandato, non lasciati la eh, rivelazione, ci pongono di fronte a una apparente dicotomia, ma che diventa sempre minore quanto più noi evolviamo da una involuzione psichica nella quale in qualche modo ci siamo ritrovati ad essere e torniamo sempre più verso il piano della coscienza, quindi più ci si allontana dalla coscienza ontologica, dalla coscienza profonda, più si viene presi in questo vortice di contraddizioni tra materia fisica e materia psichica. È interessante perché entrambi queste energie vengono definite come tre criti o materia o natura materiale. Mentre esiste un'altra energia, un'energia superiore, definita paraprakriti, che è di natura superiore e non ha una uh, corrispondenza nello stesso paradigma, è veramente altro. Ora, questo essere altro la dipinge come se fosse altro anche in termini di coscienza, perché si crea una identificazione come nello schema che andremo a vedere, schema numero uno. Uh, mi sembra poco leggibile a questa distanza, e mi dispiace. Possiamo vedere come sulla parte di sinistra uh, della, della prima linea ci sia una descrizione di ciò che è l'essenza, di ciò che è l'essere, di ciò che viene definito in questi testi come Atman. Mentre sulla parte destra dello schema, sempre considerando la prima linea che era la sotto della striscia, abbiamo quella che è la sostanza, quella che è la eh, corpusità della materia, ciò che rappresenta 
l'aspetto non pensante, non senziente, non cosciente. E non è verso, così se intendiamo cosmogonia come la scienza del cosmo, si manifesta proprio dall'incontro di queste due energie, che sono l'energia dell'atma o della coscienza e l'energia della gravità interiore, che naturalmente in, in senso convenzionale utilizzo questo termine inferiore, che rappresenta il materiale a disposizione, ma che a quel livello non è un materiale visibile, sensibile, non è soggetto all'esperienza empirica. Il suo nome originario, che viene dato nel tavola con la filosofia santa, è Pradana. Questo Pradana è come dire su di un piano intuibile, ma anche ciò dipende dal livello di coscienza. Dobbiamo pensare a una psicologia che è abbastanza differente dalla psicologia occidentale, che è molto dipendente, la quale è molto dipendente dalle scienze oggettive, quindi dalla scienza positiva, e dipende molto da una dimostrazione, da un'esperienza di laboratorio che in questo caso invece non può essere fatta perché ha necessità di sistemi che gli sono molto più propri, ovvero il sistema di introspezione. Ora, tutto ciò che può studiare la scienza fisica, e abbiamo visto, soprattutto nel secolo scorso, quanto cammino, quanto, quante scoperte, quante conquiste abbia eh, ottenuto, si, ci troviamo sempre di fronte o in prossimità di una variante di un agente esterno alla materia fisica che stiamo studiando che è proprio lo spettro del contributo della coscienza, la coscienza o il centro e il eh, punto di riferimento di tutta l'esperienza cognitiva. L'incontro, dicevamo, tra, tra Gritti e Borussia, tra la sostanza e l'essenza, Secondo questa antica scuola di pensiero produce una forza, una energia, un'entità che si chiama Mahat, che deve essere spiegato anche secretamente, è importante dare alcuni eh, dati per comprendere che non si tratta di un ente definito o di una persona, si tratta semplicemente di un ingrediente, si tratta di un componente. Pancia Carmen e in facoltà di senso Pancia Piano 
Ora, attraverso la facoltà di senso si produce l'organo di senso. Sarebbe come dire se eh, la funzione fosse più importante dell'organo che va a espletare la funzione stessa, ovvero dell'organo fisico che serve per avere quel tipo di esperienza. Così mentre con la parte di sinistra, come possiamo vedere, disegnata eh, in maniera così eh, rapida, a forma di schizzo, si manifesta un embrione di struttura psichica, sulla parte di destra, il ramo di destra, quello che volge verso destra, vediamo che si forma il mondo, il mondo il cosmo, così l'universo come ce lo dà la percezione sensoriale. Ma questa cosmogonia, cioè questo venire a, alla manifestazione, viene sempre da elementi eh, progressivamente più sottili. Infatti ciò che si produce per primo sono queste tornate, come se fossero degli archetti, come se fossero delle eh, registrazioni che già esistono e che prendono la loro forma per la interazione della coscienza e della materia, quindi della coscienza e della materia, dell'essenza e della sostanza. Queste cinque eh, forme archetipiche che rappresentano l'udito, il tatto, la vista, il gusto e l'olfatto non sono gli oggetti di questi stessi sensi, ma sono a monte, ovvero sono delle forme anche di vivi che creano e che mantengono una varietà nel mondo che poi diventerà fisico, producendo innanzitutto dal vivo il suono, dalla dal tanto l'arte e tutti i materiali gassosi. È interessante anche a questo punto come questo eh, prodotto si cristallizzi, si appesantisca, si convertisce sempre di più fino a diventare percepibile ai sensi, fino a diventare oggetto delle esperienze vive. Così dal dito il suono, dal suono l'etere. Etere è interessante come concetto perché in sanscrito Akasha indica sia lo spazio assolutamente non vuoto ma lo spazio come contenitore e anche un contenuto che appunto è l'etere che è di difficile definizione non mi provo nemmeno in pochi minuti a dare una definizione di Akasha in senso filosofico e psicologico ma questo per capire come da Intermandra, che sono come degli archetipi, che sono in una forma astratta, ma non irreale e non, non esistente, si derivi da Intermandra dell'udito, l'organo dell'udito e anche l'oggetto dell'udito, ovvero il suono, e lo spazio in cui il suono poi si diffonde. Come le idee si diffondono nella mente, come i pensieri si diffondono nella mente, Così il suono si riforma nello spazio, in Akasha. Ora, il mondo fisico, il mondo che viene a concretizzarsi per chi osserva attraverso la sola percezione sensoriale, appare come l'unica realtà, appare come la realtà esistente senza che necessiti di altro, ma in realtà è l'ultimo processo di creazione è l'ultimo passaggio, è l'esito di una lunga trasformazione di oggetti sottili. Per riprendere di nuovo l'argomento utilizzato prima dai miei colleghi, da altri relatori, soprattutto il professor Scivanza che parlava di una pena, una pena prima di essere una pena è stata un'idea, è stata un'idea nella mente di un progettista, è diventata un disegno, poi è diventato un oggetto fisico, costruito, tecnologico, per la computatore laser, ma nasce da un'embrione di un'idea, tutto nasce da un'idea, ma non è così assimilabile, forse è analogo al platonismo, al vero platonismo, ma non è il platonismo. Questa visione è che tutte queste idee provengono da una sorgente 
telefonica che produce questa apparente dicotomia di spirito e di materia, ma in realtà nella evoluzione, se vogliamo intenderci in termini convenzionali, uno scivolone prima psichico e poi metafisico, si riproduce la unitarietà del tutto e uno, come diceva stamani il professor Marchi, quando comincia la vera evoluzione, ovvero il ritorno attraverso il mondo fisico al mondo psichico e dal mondo psichico al mondo spirituale, ovvero al mondo di dove si produce la coscienza. Quindi questa coscienza non è prodotto e non è neanche un attributo della psiche, come molti nel mondo occidentale tendono a credere in dove si pensa che la psiche, la mente, sia il soggetto dell'esperienza, in questa antica filosofia e psicologia la mente è oggetto dell'esperienza, ma non eh, soggetto. Il soggetto sta a un livello superiore ed è appunto quell'essenza che in molti passi delle scritture antiche, vediche o coraniche che vengono chiamate, viene chiamata come Atman o Ishwara o Purusha o Jiva per indicare semplicemente la vita.